Hey you, you're listening to episode 134 of the Keto Diet Podcast. Today we're chatting about the offenders in common keto products, what goes behind developing a keto product, and how to travel with keto foods. If you have questions about today's content, head on over to healthfulpursuit.com slash contact and ask me. Today's podcast extras and transcripts, plus links to the thermos that we chat about and some of the bars and snacks that we chat about. About, you can head on over to healthfulpursuit.com slash podcast slash E134 and everything will be there for you. I've got one cool thing for you today, and that is that my newest cookbook, The Keto Diet Cookbook, hits shelves April 9th, 2019. It's a complete roadmap to preparing keto meals based on your hunger level without having to rely on macro counting or calorie tracking, complete with 141 recipes made from whole foods and zero fancy ingredients. Plus, each and every single recipe is a complete meal with balanced keto macros. And when you pre-order, you'll be entered to win a $500 keto pantry bundle, complete with everything you need to make fat burning your number one priority. To enter, all you got to do is pre-order the book by going to ketodietbook.com. Then once you've pre-ordered the book, go back to ketodietbook.com and click on the free with your copy link at the top of the page, enter in your details, and you'll be automatically entered to win. The bundle includes cooking essentials like almond flour, cacao butter, cacao powder, erythritol, keto baking mixes, shredded coconut, hemp seeds, nut and seed butters, coconut milk, gelatin, collagen, bone broth, lard, pork rinds, avocado oil, ghee, cacao nibs, chocolate chips, chia seeds, apple cider vinegar, and a whole bunch of keto snacks too. You can pre-order the Keto Diet Cookbook by going to ketodietbook.com. There are a bunch of ways that you can pre-order and the giveaway is open until April 8th, 2019. So when you get your copy at ketodietbook.com, head back over to that page, click on the free with your copy link enter in your details and you will be automatically entered to win. Good luck. Okay, let's do this thing. Welcome to the Keto Diet Podcast, the show all about keto for women so you can burn fat, balance your hormones and heal your body. Starting and maintaining keto can be challenging without the right support. So just for listening to the podcast, I want to give you 20% off the keto beginning with the coupon code keto podcast. That's all one word. This 30-day program gives you a clear step-by-step how-to so you can quickly adapt to a ketogenic diet, avoid common struggles, and get the results you crave. Go to healthfulpursuit.com slash begin to get your keto beginning discount today. If you're new around these parts, I'm Leanne Vogel. You may know me as the international best-selling author of The Keto Diet, founder of HappyKetoBody.com, or maybe you know me as the nutritionist that likes dipping pork rinds in avocado oil mayo. I'm so glad you're here with me today. Thanks so much for listening. Our guest today is Melissa Lorton, who is the founder of Key Fuels, the high fat, low net carb, ethically sourced natural foods company that brought us the key fat for real food, keto macro bars, and the key pantry, including the first keto macro pizza flatbread crust mix. Guys, this stuff is amazing. Having personally experienced the benefits of maintaining a nutritional ketogenic lifestyle since 2014, even while traveling over 280 days a year for her consulting career, Melissa founded Key in 2017 to help others explore the benefits of increasing fats and reducing sugars for themselves. She believes in fueling bodies with organic, ethically sourced real food that serves our bodies, our communities, and our environment well. Melissa spends a lot of time skiing, running, skiing, 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 cooking, traveling, and skiing some more. Key Life is a partner of the Keto Diet Podcast, but I wanted to have Melissa on to talk about something that is super important, the quality of packaged keto food. Because if the package says keto, that's only the beginning of the things that we should be looking for. And as keto gains popularity, we'll continue to see more keto products emerge on the market. And not all of them are focused on quality. A couple of months ago, Kevin and I did a video on YouTube, which you can find by going to healthfulpursuit.com slash podcast slash E134. I'll include a link in the show notes there so you can check it out. And we tried a bunch of healthy and garbage keto snacks and rated them based on our taste. So I would highly recommend checking that out. 
And if you're looking for more information on whole foods and why quality foods are important on your keto journey so that you can heal your body, balance your hormones, and actually shed excess weight, you can check out the keto beginning by going to healthfulpursuit.com slash begin. There's one thing I want to mention to you before you listen to today's episode. We do talk about weight in this episode. So if you are triggered by the conversation of weight loss or weight in particular, I would highly recommend just skipping this episode. Okay, let's cut over to this interview. Hey, Melissa, how are you? Fabulous, you? I'm so good. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I'm ecstatic to be here. It's my cool. delight. Yes, it is. Okay, so... um. So excited to get into today's topic and something I love to ask our guests when they come on the show. My very first question is, what does keto mean to you? Right now, it's my whole world (laughs) since I'm building a company around it. But there are definitely two layers for me. One is a physical layer and why I personally maintain keto. And then there's a huge psychological layer for me as well. And the physical layer is that keto for me has actually relieved or broken the food addictions that I had throughout my life because of athletics and and having this constant fear of not having enough energy to maintain the lifestyle that I wanted to have. And then there's a psychological piece as well that I started keto through a journey when I was recovering from a car accident. I had read Pearl Mutter's book, Brain Brain, and he talked about that it could help with headaches. And, and I had literally disabling headaches. And keto keto didn't end up solving the headache problem but I was able to recover. I was able to go back to work in spite of literally three dozen doctors, East and Western practitioners telling me I would never recover. And so psychologically, keto is hooked in for me of don't ever give up hope. And along my journey and starting my company as well, the thing that keeps me going is hearing these amazing stories where people have transformed with keto and just never, never, never give up. I have that as one of my first Instagram posts as I was starting to dabble in it, because that is really my mantra. So that whole psychological layer of, of hope and encouragement and curiosity is, is all about what keto is. It's about challenging norms and maintaining mm, that hope. So beautifully said. And I always find that so inspiring when I get to connect with women specifically who have used keto for things that I didn't even know it could do. And they get their lives back in a way that they never thought possible. And every doctor said, they wouldn't, um, and in a lot of cases, wouldn't survive. I met an 18 year old woman who ha- had a tumor and she lost her eyesight. She couldn't walk. And it was just, um, she started gaining a lot of weight because she couldn't move and people were picking on her and she couldn't see anything. And it would just sounded like her story just, uh, it hit me so hard and I was crying and she was there and she was walking and she was and I was just bawling. I mean, it's such it's a, it's it's such a gift that I didn't even know could exist in a person's life. So that's really cool that you feel the same. Okay, so what what keeps you eating keto? What is like what keeps you every day wanting to eat this way, develop products for this way of living? It's delicious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I. I am, food is love to me in general, and I have been on dozens upon dozens of diets, health routines, lifestyles, whatever you want to call them throughout my life. And for me now, I never feel like I'm giving up anything. I feel like I am cheating every single day when I eat brie cheese and macadamia nuts. I love bread. I studied pastry for a while. And and so I know good carbs by all means, but I, I just don't feel like I'm suffering at all when I get to eat these other things that I felt like were off limits my entire life because I was so disciplined with low fat when I didn't have energy. And two, with my athletics, I always struggled to maintain my weight and my energy. And I rode in college. Um, I was I was an elite high school skier as well. And I was constantly carb loading. I went into training for marathons after college as well constantly carb loading. And during my college and the five years after undergrad as well, even with working out five to seven days a week, even up to four hours a day, my weight kind of went in between 155. My max ever was 172 and constantly fiddling with things, never enough energy. And I finally, when I moved back to Colorado in 2005, I dropped 10 pounds immediately and was able to maintain 145. But still, never enough energy, constantly starving, 
and constantly eating. I'd be in my consulting roles at my clients all over the US and I'd always have a snack because I was always hungry. And so it gives me more energy. I can go on a 14 mile run and never have to stop for food or to, to uh, you know, do a shot block or, or whatever sugary carb load, just have to have the water. And I can literally ski hard bumps doing backcountry hiking from 8 a.m. until 4.30 p.m. I never have to stop for lunch. And if my friends stop for lunch, I will literally just have tea or coffee just to give me a, a warm boost and, and um, some water. I do during that also maintain magnesium and sodium to make sure that my electrolytes um, don't come along with uh, potassium. But just the energy is absolutely amazing. So in general, I had struggled with my weight, but then I was kind of comfortable in that 145 range and was happy with my weight. I was no longer thick boned, as, <laughs> as my friends said for so many years. And then when I started key as well, um, a year ago, I said, well, I have a natural foods company now. I, I'm fit, but I could be a little bit leaner. So maybe I start to play with this and, and actually really track what I'm eating day to day. So I used the calculator for about three weeks and I realized I was literally consuming 3000 to 3,500 calories a day, but I was still maintaining 145. So when we talk about calories in, calories out, yes, I think calories do have some impact there. And yet I was able to maintain that, that steady weight. So what I ended up doing was playing with that and targeted more 1800 to 2000 calories a day through intermittent fasting. I skip dinner, not breakfast. That's kind of, I'm tired at the end of the day and just don't feel like dealing with food. So it was natural for me and immediately dropped 10 pounds. And now I literally go in between 128 and 132 without effort. And, and that to me is just this huge, I, I struggled with it for so long. And I always, I literally for years on my calendar have a goal of 134 for my weight. And now I'm below that. And it's effortless. So it's, it's really pretty cool between the energy and just feeling more felt. And what, what motivated you to want to start key because you had a good job and you know, all that. And then you just left your job, correct? To f fulfill your dreams. Um, why? <laughs> I've always loved food. Food was love in our family. I had a five course meal for breakfast every single morning because it was brain power with eggs and whole wheat waffles and sausage and bacon and everything else. And my mother would not allow me to go to school without that. So food is love in my family. And um, I worked in kitchens to put myself through college and also went to pastry school for a little bit. I wanted to be a cake decorator and build glorious 3D cakes, but I wasn't brave enough at the time. And then just through my keto journey and getting tired of eating those delicious macadamia nuts day after day and day and wanting to have a little bit of variation. Playing with my traveling, I said, I, I just want a snack and or something that I can go to easily on the airplane, basically. I was on the airplane one day and I had one of the very few bars that has been on the market for a long time. And it comes in a vacuum sealed pack and I was starving and I couldn't get it open. <laughs> and so here I had gotten an alternative and I'm tearing it open. I ended up getting my toenail cover out to get my bar open. <laughs> um, and, and so then I started playing in the, in the kitchen and I thought originally I'll just build out my basement and do a little professional kitchen and, and sell in some farmer's markets and fund my ski habit a little bit more for some extra money. And then I started hearing more stories about keto from people. And I thought, if I can make this more convenient and actually fill still a void that is there because everything does have stevia or monk fruit or dragon fruit in it, and I simply don't like those, if I can start to fill that void, that could be super fun. And then I, when I was doing my market research and realized literally the hundreds of millions going into billions of people who are sick with different conditions that keto can help. My goal on my website is to help 200 million people to impact their lives in some way. And, and that's not a fake number because of how many people are affected by disease and metabolic syndromes in our world. So that's really what drove it. Cool. Back to today's episode in a sec. 
Some people choose to do plant-based keto, others do carnivore keto, and I'd like to think I'm somewhere in the middle, loving meat and plants. I thrive on the right kind of animal protein, protein from healthy animals, animals that get treated fairly, have happy lives on pasture, and are raised ethically. This is why I choose to eat grass-fed and finished beef, free-range chicken, heritage-bred pork, and wild fish. And I'm so happy I can get these options from ButcherBox, a meat subscription service I've used since 2016. Listeners of the show get $20 off plus free ground beef for life. What does this mean? Well, if you head on over to butcherbox.com slash keto diet and sign up as a new member, you'll receive two pounds of ground beef in every order for the life of your subscription. This offer is only valid for the month of March 2019. So you can go to butcherbox.com slash keto diet to get $20 off your first order plus free ground beef for life. Okay, back to today's episode. What have you learned about food products since you started? Like, I know I asked um, a friend this recently, and she was like, you have no idea. It's, it's crazy. So what, what have you learned about just the food industry in general, since starting to develop your product and getting larger, like not just supermarkets, but you have like amazing packaging and just all the all the intricacies of all that. It's really, really hard. And I would not have done it at this point if I knew what I know now when I got started. It's no turning back now because I've invested a tremendous amount of money. And, and so it's the stories that keep me going. But as you walk down your supermarket and see all of those aisles, it is absolutely amazing the amount of effort that it takes to to put a product on the shelf. And even just to get it in that first package between regulations and food science, my product, for example, because it is made of real food, I'm not selling it on Amazon. Amazon has a six month requirement for shelf stability. And when the product gets down to two months, they literally just throw it away. And because mine does not have preservatives in it at all, we only have a four month shelf stability for the chocolate chip and a five month shelf stability for the quad chocolate. So just the fact that it's in those packages <laughs> um, and, and not there molding and killing people, it's, it's really amazing the amount of effort that goes into it. I can't, you caught me off guard with the whole two month throwing out thing of food being thrown out. Oh dear. Um. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's amazing just in general, the food waste that goes on. 30% of our landfills are filled with food waste that is not consumed that could be eaten by people, but that's a whole different topic. So there's, there's some, um, Definitely the shelf stability. I think to when when I first went into this, for example, I, I was fitting that personal need. And part of where I had struggled with keto was I literally couldn't get enough healthy fats without because you can find healthy proteins without fat and you can find sugar with that. And so um, originally I created the product and, and it was 85% macro fat. Um, and then I did some consumer research and Based on the feedback, I ended up balancing out the macros more to that 75% fat level with some protein in there. So we've got 15 to 20% in our products and then just as minimal carbs as we can get. But our food industry is still lagging. It's not set up for keto. So when I originally, for example, did my research, I was just going to bake in my basement. And then I learned about these things called co-manufacturers that can do this for you. And I thought, brilliant, then I can be in the business of selling and not manufacturing. But the problem is that they are set up for chemicals and they are set up for sugar. And so, for example, there are some companies that will work with very small bar vendors that you can do a minimum order of 12 bars if you want to. You can do a minimum order of 100 bars. With that, though, for example, they didn't have the organic products that I wanted. They didn't have the different types of nuts and seeds that I was seeking. And so with that, each one comes a $500 to $1,000 fee. And then the, the fees just keep on building and building. The alternative is working with a co-manufacturer that it's typically a minimum of 5,000 units. So you have to feel confident that within your shelf stability, you can sell 5,000 units. And it goes on and on and on. My first co-manufacturer went bankrupt after I had worked with them for four, four months. And they used my funding for a food scientist for a large chain to develop one of their bars instead of focusing on mine. Another one I worked with for three months and they kept on kind of pushing it back. And I finally, three months later, got a quote for conventional ingredients that each bar would cost $1.80 to make. That doesn't include packaging. It doesn't include any marketing overhead. And people complain if they can't get a bar for $1.50. <laughs> so it, it completely blew my whole financial 
model to pieces. So that's just the co-manufacturing piece. And then, you know, you, you talked a little bit about the packaging. And for example, you need to go through a whole FDA review, but you can't do that until you're stabilizing your formula. It took four different food scientists working with me with my original recipe to get it to shelf stability. And I ended up working with an amazing woman who's semi-retired, who lives on a farm in Michigan, and we had the same values. But uh, one of my food scientists said, we have to use GMO ingredients. I said, we use GMO. I quit. I go back to consulting tomorrow. You're fired. <laughs> she wanted to put in some ingredients that I didn't agree with. And because she just kept saying, without sugar, without chemicals, this is not possible. I don't deal well with, I can't do this. <laughs> she was <laughs> So that end, that end food scientist, she was amazing. We still, we still keep in touch and, and she gives me ideas as I'm developing new products. But you have to stabilize the formula. Then you have to send it out for shelf testing, which your packaging is dependent upon. Your nutrition information is dependent upon. So there are all these chicken egg relationships that it gets pushed out month after month after month. I, with my lack of humility and experience, when I first set in, I quit my consulting job the end of August of 2017. And I thought I would have a product ready to sell by October of 2017. We just launched in September of 2018. So if, for example, you do want to do this, first email me. <laughs> and I'll tell you why not to do it, but also why to do it. I'm not afraid of sharing things. I think it's really important for us all to work together so that we can get as many keto products out there and, and make it more um, sustainable. But, but just in general, be ready for three times contingency. I had 30% contingency in all of my models when I started. Expected, my mentor just recently said, anywhere from three to nine times, expect that. I hope you're totally digging this episode. I love putting these together every week and I hope you're getting something out of it. I love seeing where you're listening from. So next time you're listening or even right now, take a picture of yourself watching the show or a screenshot of your favorite episode and tag me on Instagram at healthful pursuit. And if social isn't your thing, that's totally fine. Just jump on your favorite podcast player and leave a review for the show. Okay, back to the good stuff. Wow. And, and you've mentioned a little bit about ingredient quality, like you mentioned, like genetically modified ingredients, sugar. Why are you so passionate personally about ingredient quality? <laughs> going, going back to my comments before regarding my athletic lifestyle, I, I have eaten pretty much anything that I thought could get me to my goals, except for performance enhancing drugs and things. But if I would eat things that absolutely tasted horrible, if I thought it was going to get me through something athletically. At this point in my life, I want to enjoy life. <laughs> and I believe in real ingredients. I have my own garden now. I grew up with one, but never got into it into my accident. And it's, it's just very nurturing to me to actually feel that ground, feel that soil. And so when we talk about GMO versus conventional, which is basically the most of the ingredients that we have versus organic, or now we're also getting into regenerative even, that there are those different cycles. And, and I believe in feeding my body with real foods. And then there's also that bigger picture of the planet that it's just really important to me for generations to come, whether it's the soil and the way it trickles down, it's downstream and impacts other people or animals and um, the planet as a whole. And you mentioned that you don't like sweeteners, like you mentioned stevia, erythritol. Is there a reason why you avoid sweeteners or is it just because you don't like them? Because one thing I like about your bars is that they don't have sweeteners and I can actually like taste the ingredients. Whereas bars with sweeteners, it's like, cool, I'm chowing down on some erythritol right now. Right, right. So, and, and it's truly just a tasting for me because I think, for example, with, with IMO, um, the iso malto oligosaccharides, I can't even pronounce it, which is also labeled as tapioca fiber syrup um, or cost of a fiber syrup. In the first place, with ingredients like those, for example, we don't necessarily know the impact on our, our blood sugars. So I think it's important to keep aware of that. But flavors like stevia and monk fruit, I recently read something that said, they had to add it because it just didn't taste good. For me, we are starting with delicious coconut. I, I can just eat it by the handful. And, and you include all of those amazing ingredients, and I don't think you have to cover it up. There's also just our palates are trained with sugar. And um, so, so as people, you lessen your, it's not so much the addiction, but just your palate, you change your palate. It's not, you, you don't miss it as much. And to me now, a, a pink lady apple is just totally candy. It's delicious. But I actually maybe subconsciously 
forgot to add the brown sugar in our Thanksgiving pie. And I still thought it was delicious. <laughs> so I made it for my family. Uh, my family kind of goes, my brother and his, his wife go in and out of keto. My mom tried it. It's not for her. So we're, we're kind of a keto, non-keto family. And, and they all didn't like it. I, I ended up eating all the leftovers and thought it was delicious. I'm going to make pie without any sweetener whatsoever going forward. Like yeah, that that's how, that's good. how we do it too. I'm so used to it. Um, I've been making this like nut seed based porridge thing for my husband for like, oh, I don't know, at least two years. And I don't know what happened. Oh, our sailing captain made us breakfast, which was so sweet of her. And we were sailing and I said, yeah, just put the porridge in a bowl and add hot water. And she thought that because we had monk fruit drops, in the pantry that she would add monk fruit to it. So she added monk fruit and Kevin took one bite. He's like, what, what is this? Like, it <laughs> gross. this is disgusting. And this was like the proudest moment of my life, like to look over at him and he say that he just wants his normal, boring almond porridge that just says like ground up almonds and chia seeds, just plain <laughs> was like, finally. <laughs> no, and, and it does, it takes some adjustment. And, and I think for example, too, it, it, there's, there's a limit though as well. And it's awaring, it's, it's building an awareness of what you're putting in your body. And this is something that I'm really trying to focus on. Um, we're going to have a calculator on our website that you can input any nutrition label and understand, okay, it, it says it has five grams of carbs, but what is that on my profile, for example, and versus how much fat it is, because the regulations don't say we have to have 40 gram servings right now. So something that looks like it's smaller could actually be adding larger increments. And so for example, with chocolate, I think it really actually helped me get over the cusp with sweetness, but I was dead set on, I could only eat 100% or 99% chocolate for the longest time. And then as I started actually doing the calculations, when I was finding chocolate chips for our bars, I realized that the different cacao levels, that actually means that they can have the cacao powder in there that's the ground up cocoa beans. And then they can add sugar that, for example, gets it down to 70%. They all are also adding fat. So it's actually that some 80 to 85%, even 70% chocolates will have fewer carbs than a 100%. So I think it was a useful exercise in that it got rid of some of my cravings for the sweetness while still giving me the chocolate. But now I eat 75 to 80% chocolate on a regular basis. I think it tastes better and it's actually got fewer carbs. Back to today's episode in a sec. Today's episode is sponsored by Key, whole food keto bars created with love by a solo lady keto entrepreneur. I first tried Key bars during sailing training where taking a break for lunch was not in the cards for the entire crew. First bite and I was hooked. These are whole food keto bars. No fiber fillers, no sweeteners, no stevia, no sugar alcohols, just collagen, gelatin, cacao butter, coconut, chocolate chips, and a couple of other whole food ingredients for real food flavor. You can actually taste the ingredients. There are a couple flavor variations of the bar. My personal favorite is quad chocolate because it's nut and seed free. However, Kevin's favorite is chocolate chip. You can try yours today by going to healthfulpursuit.com slash K-E and using the coupon code Leanne10, that's L-E-A-N-N-E-1-0 for 10% off. If you're unsure of the link, simply check out today's show notes for all the details. Okay, back to today's episode. What's like the product, because I know, you know, getting started and getting the bars figured out and all of those things has been such a challenge to get to this moment, but what are some products that you kind of dream of creating in the future? What's coming up next for you? The problem is that my favorite part of all of this is the creation and the product development. So I'm always thinking of new products. And for example, I, I did the bar to fit that personal need originally, and then I just, I do love pizza and I didn't have the time to be making fathead pizza every day as much as I would have loved to. And then when I'd make it, all my friends and family would eat all of it, even though I would tell them it's loaded with fat. You shouldn't be eating that. <laughs> yeah. Leave it to me. I'll take care of it. <laughs> it's fine. And so what ended up happening with the pizza was I, I deployed the bars and then right away I started working on the pizza and my family called me out on it because they said, 
you are escaping the things that you don't want to do like marketing and working on more product development. So I have a list of probably about 24 different products that I'd like to make. And some of them, for example, it could just be as simple as a cracker leveraging the work that we've done with the pizza. But what I would also say with that for anybody who's looking at starting a food company is it's super important to understand the market. So for example, there are literally over 350 major brands that produce bars. And we aren't even talking about, for example, that Cliff Bar has eight different types of bars underneath their bar brand, right? And so when I started getting into bars at first, everybody said, oh, there's 300, 400 different bar companies. Why would you want to do that? Mine's different. Mine's keto. Well, now there are a couple dozen keto bars, right? So, and then also through my research, my original flavor profiles were the chocolate chip, quad chocolate, bacon cayenne, and ginger turmeric. Yes, I just saw your face. People can't because I'm talking. (laughs) But I talk about bacon cayenne. But I did a consumer survey. And out of the 200 people queried, bacon, cayenne, and ginger turmeric, which ginger turmeric was actually my favorite, all fell to the bottom third from a flavor profile. So just because I am dreaming up all these two dozen different products that I want to make, it doesn't mean that the market's going to receive it well. When, when I started looking at pizza and looked at Google Analytics, there are three times as many queries on keto pizza as there are on keto bars. And yet there's nobody in the marketplace yet. So if you guys think you're super clever, and can get it out there, please do. (laughs) Because I am all for competitors. I am all for the more products that we can provide, the better. Because it is going to enable the lifestyle and it's going to be able to give people more choice and more flexibility. And if you like Stavia and you want a sweet bar, a key bar is not going to be your favorite. You, You should go, frankly, with some of the other products that are out there, which are really amazing. If you want something that doesn't have Stavia in it, we've given you an option for that. So... The more competitors, the better. Yeah, I totally agree. And it allows the consumer to make choices and have options and I'm all for it. And okay, so you got into developing key, I think, because of all your traveling and just being able to have keto on the road and all the things you were doing. Let's chat about let's chat rather about um, keto and travel. I'm sure you have some travel stories, airline stories. Yes. So probably my biggest tip, um, because one of my favorite Right after chocolate and pizza, some of my favorite foods are cucumbers and mixing it. I'm, I do a homemade aioli when I'm at home and I can't do that, but I'll take a travel pack of Sir Kensington's mayonnaise. It's not organic, but it's the best I can find for travel. Um, it's tasty. And if you bring a cucumber on the airplane, because it has so much water in it, it will register as a water bottle. So if you happen to want to bring <laughs> cucumber, you have to take it out of your bag for TSA, even if it's cucumber. When, when I first started prototyping the key bars as well, and I, and I went um, to the Expo West, which is the largest natural foods food expo, talk about Disney World. It, it, I was working 20 hours a day and felt like I was on vacation after seven days of it. But I, I brought this huge zip bag of samples because I was going to show everybody how amazing the product was. And I got stopped by TSA because it was such a large organic mass and fat registers differently through TSA scanners. So they literally pulled my bag all apart because of that. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I told her, give me your, I'll, I'll send you guys at DIA TSA some, some bars once I get them out there. I still have to do that. <laughs> Other tips for traveling. Um, I, I post them periodically on, on the Instagram, but my biggest thing as I was traveling back and forth was taking small glass vials of liquids that are that make your life better. So for me, heavy whipping cream, I use a lot of cream in my coffee. And so when I literally ask for five creams from United to make their Illy coffee delicious, um, and they look at me, it it's just got more carbs in it with their cream. So to balance that out, I would bring heavy whipping cream. I'd also put organic MCT oil in it. Again, with having more competitors and more solutions for the marketplace, I am seeing MCTs now um, in packages. I just prefer organic. We've also got the powder, obviously, for MCT. In order to get MCT oils into a powder, you have to add some carbs into it to encapsulate it to get it into that dry form. So I don't personally use MCT powder. I think you do. So again, personal choice, but it's just having those different options. Other huge win is you can freeze liquids. So for example, I'm a a huge eater of whole fat Greek yogurt. And if I freeze in in advance, you can take it on the airplane. Same thing with guacamole, for example, to eat with that cucumber if you want it. And then just kind of going back to my story, I think of 
before you are relying on a food that you're bringing on the airplane, make sure you can open it because I told you about the story with the, the keto bar and then a lot of jerkies, for example, use that vacuum seal packaging too. So if you're delayed on a tarmac for 10 hours and you can't get your food open, it doesn't really matter in the end. Um, and I think too, for ordering, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of answers and I am a huge fan of popcorn. I actually get some popcorns and then just put grass fed butter all over it, um, at home. But for example, I'm a, I'm a United girl and they used to have a, I can't even think of the brand now, but they used to have a popcorn that was done in coconut oil. Um, bootable, bootable popcorn. Yeah, and, I was and, thinking it was like bootalicious yeah. or something. Yeah, bootable. And I absolutely loved it. And they, they ended up taking it off the menu. So that was my only keto snack that I could have. And for example, because of my premier status, because I used to travel so much, I get free meals. So I would, for a little bit, I was getting just their hamburgers. Well, you actually read the ingredients on the hamburgers or their omelets, things that you think would be safe. And when, when you deal with the different altitudes, even the coffee gets off. That's why airplane coffee doesn't work the whole food science changes so they add sugar and it's, it's not because it's literally an altitude thing so just be aware if you're doing that that if you're going to have a hamburger and even peel off the bun you're still going to get a lot more carbs and so what i would recommend with that is if you are actually eating airplane food make sure that if you aren't comfortable with your body and how it reacts on keto that you're just measuring your ketones and, and know what the best choice is for you on the most positive note though um i recently flew and again i I am very lucky to get upgrades. So I've got upgraded to first class and United now has something that they're calling a protein plate, which literally aside from the Chobani yogurt that was on the side, it had salmon, olives, almonds on a bed of lettuce. And I thought, and, and a piece of brie cheese. And I thought I had died and gone to heaven. So I actually, it's on my to-do list to email United and say, I need to post this on my social media. It's amazing because you don't even understand how you just changed my life because it made it so much easier. And then the final thing that I would say is I do a lot of experimenting now with fasting and intermittent fasting. And this goes back to my releasing some of them, my addiction and fears with food is that keto and intermittent fasting has made travel so much less stressful because if before I had meetings from eight o'clock AM right until noon when I had to go to the airport and then I wasn't prepared and then I'd be starving and now I just fast. And then if I got home at nine o'clock at night and I was hungry, I would eat. And if I wasn't, then I would just go to bed. So, so that whole mentality has made it much easier, but generally I'm super prepared and always tell people who are sitting next to me, if we're stranded for 12 hours, they can have a bunch of nuts and now few bars. <laughs> Yeah, that's how I travel now. Like when I'm on tour, I just don't eat all day. And then I have one big meal after an event. And it's just so much easier. But I've had experiences like that where people take things out of my bag. And I'm like, I swear it's not, it's not liquid. It might look like it. On <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so much less stress, so much less stress. So. Yeah, totally. What do you think is missing in the keto space right now for women? I frankly think I Part of the reason why I started following you a couple of years ago was because not having enough research on understanding the long and longer term impacts on women. So I, I think you know that I'm such a fan of, of all that you do for women in general. I personally am not a risk taker and am, am very much, I need proof and data before I'll take action. And, and that's why I've become comfortable, for example, with fasting is because I've read a lot of data about it at this point. I read something a couple of years ago that said, when families have children, men will often refer to the child as a science experiment. And, and women just don't do that. It's not just to, to make a grand generalization. We are more emotive. And I think it's super important for us to self-experiment. I think it's important to do that under some protection of a doctor. As much as I don't like doctors, I do a lot of blood tests to make sure that I'm not screwing something up for the longer term. But it's kind of like buying a pair of jeans. Keto is not going to be the exact macros for everybody. We all have different athletic requirements. We all have different cravings. For me, frankly, carb cycling, I, it's, a, it's a slippery slope for me. So I just avoid it because I know that once I start, I'm not going to stop. So I just avoid that. And, and it's important for you to know as an individual, just like that pair of jeans, what is fitting for you. And, and for example, I don't really measure ketones because I can just tell when I'm in or out of ketosis after doing it for five years. But every once in a while, I'll play with it. Uh, and then just knowing your body and listening to your body and, and using that intuition and then using other data points to back it that are scientific. And so, for example, 
two years ago, my energy was super low. And I went to my doctor, got a blood test, and my thyroid levels spiked, which I had had a little bit of a problem with in the past. And really what it happening was that I was eating so many cruciferous vegetables that it was altering my thyroid. And because I was using arugula and broccoli and Brussels sprouts and all of my favorite vegetables as vessels for oil, <laughs> just loading them up. My, my common go-to meal when I was traveling was a bucket of organic arugula from Whole Foods doused with olive oil with some Parmesan cheese sprinkled on top. Um, and then I, I would kind of mix in some protein here and there. So I cut out uh, the cruciferous vegetables for about 18 months. And, and I missed them a lot, but just used other lettuces and vegetables and things. And then eventually I was able to add them in. So super important, I think, to be curious, to self-experiment, but also do it in a smart way and, and work with a doctor, a specialist, um, a nutritionist who can help guide you. But you know your body best and, and they can heal. That's going back to our opening comments. Yeah, completely. I totally agree with you. And where can people find more from you? Well... On your website, on your favorites, we've got the bars listed now. So if anybody wants a discount, go to Leanne's website and link in through there for the link or the discount code. And otherwise, you can go straight as well to www.e.life. So that's ke.life. And then we're also on Instagram at Key Life and then on Facebook at Key Fuels. So the name of the company itself is Key Fuels. But again, another complexity when you're dealing with trademarking and infringements and it's just a bowl full of information but truly too um, in addition to the products if people do have curiosity about all the complexities that it takes to build a food product i am such a huge believer believer in collaborating we're all going to be doing things differently and i think it's really really important to work together so never hesitate to shoot me an email you can also get that through the key website just through our information form and i'm the little elf on the other side who's answering all those Amazing, Melissa. Thank you so much for sharing your brilliance and being so open and honest with us today and just hanging out with me. Always a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. Join us again in a couple of days to discover more Keto for Women secrets for your fat-fueled life. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representations or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.